all through the service it was but God with God all things are possible and sometimes we're going through a valley we're going through a hard time and we say God where are you do you know God doesn't move we move farther from God 
He's steadfast. He's unmovable. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. And the key verse was, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. So whatever you're going through, you ever gone through something and later be like, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. You become more aware, you grow, you mature. So God gives. Sometimes God takes away for a good reason. But I will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every
Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Well, this week we are honoring a special member of the church. If you don't know who it is, he may be sitting right in front of you. But it is my pleasure to welcome Brother Steve White to the platform this morning. And he's going to present the card to Pastor Abbott. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it is my pleasure and uh, my honor to be here and to uh, celebrate this day with it with you. Um, uh, it's uh, it's been uh, a journey for myself, and and God works in mysterious ways to <laughs> to uh, to get me here and my family here at this point. Um, uh, just a little um, backstory. My wife Judy and Carol uh, found their way here, and uh, and she came back to me and said, you know, she found this church, and she felt so welcome, and the family uh, unit in this in this church has been has been overwhelming for her, and she she the next week she wanted to come again. And, uh, of course, her back was injured. She needed a ride. So then I came and, um, and met yourself. And I knew this was Lana's church <laughs> from, from being her friend for so many years. And, and um, felt very welcome here. And, and hearing you speak and hearing um, you fill this church with, with God's word. And it really touched myself, and I couldn't wait to come back. And it's been it's been a, it's been a journey ever since, and and filled my heart and my soul with the Holy Spirit, and and my family also. And it's and it's it's growing in my in myself and my family. Um, and it's very touching for me, for yeah, to thank Jesus and and to fill to fill my family. Um, with the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and I want to say thank you for 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 doing this for my family, and and doing it for for everybody else. Because I know everybody else feels the same way as I do, and everybody has their reasons. And it's it's been um, God's journey for me to be here at this point. And I want to thank you, and on behalf of of everyone here at the church. And I want to wish you a happy birthday. Thanks, man. Love you. Thank you. God bless you. Well, thank you, Steve, and thanks to you all here today. You can be seated. What a, a great privilege it is to be a part of Emmanuel Lighthouse and to be a part of Pentecostals of Renfrew as well. And I was so excited this week. I had an opportunity to, along with three other, uh, other pastors that are in the process of planning daughter works in Ontario right now at our North American Mission Service, had an opportunity to speak about what has been happening in Renfrew, and it was just so gratifying to have so many people come, just so excited about what God is doing in Renfrew, and of course, people that come and tell us all the time that they're following what's happening here at Emmanuel Lighthouse, and so thrilled to see all of the baptisms, and people being filled with the Holy Ghost, and just all the great things that God is doing. It's a, it's a, Wonderful time to be a part of the church. And I was reminded this week at camp meeting, which, by the way, has been fantastic. It's been a great camp, and uh, all those that are still there, I know, are being blessed. But I was reminded, we can reflect back now, it's, it's only four years ago that we were right in the middle of the, the pandemic and locked out of the church altogether. This time, four years ago, we were just kind of coming off of, of meeting in the out at the drive-in movie theater in our cars and honking and, you know, and listening to the services there and starting to have a few people in the building and people all separated out. And, you know, at that point, it, it seemed like, you know, what in the world are we doing in building this new facility? And, of course, at that point, the idea of, of starting yet another church. 
was just unfathomable at the moment. But God knew exactly what he was doing. And, and I, uh, I want to share with you that in the month of June, we had not only our highest attendance average ever in the history of the church, we had more people come to church in the month of June than ever before. In the month of June, we had 270 people attend the service. And that just shows the signs of just continued growth in the church. I'm excited about what God is doing, and so I'm just I'm thankful to be a part. And it is it's so thrilling to to you know think about this fact that a year ago I didn't know Steve, I didn't know Judy. I think somewhere along this time close is when you first came to a service, Judy. But and then of course by extension there's so many other family members that we have we have gotten to know, Red and Linda and their family beyond that. And then of course all of Judy's family member up to and including, and I was so happy to talk about Diane and, and our presentation on Pentecost of Renfrew because she was the, the first one to bring that tithing envelope wanting to give and then to see the way that God is giving back and talking to Diane just to hear how excited she is about what God's doing in her life and what she knows God's going to do in her family. It's a, just an amazing time to be a part of the church, and I want to give God honor and glory for that. And so thank you all for this honor today, the honor of getting older, and uh, thank you for that. It is a great accomplishment. I know none of you have been able to do this before. Get old like me, so uh, congratulations to me. Amen. But uh, I do also want to honor a few others, and you know, summer's tough. Uh, people are here, there, and everywhere, but we're going to start whittling down on our graduates this year because uh, it's going to be hit or miss in having them all here, but we do want to honor those that are here today, and so we have both some uh, grade 8 graduates and then also so some high school graduates, and some of those are here today. I'm going to read off all of their names here today, and obviously we'll, uh, we've got a, a card for those that are present here today. The others we will get to. And so if you happen to know these people and you hear their name called, you have motivation to say, hey, you might want to get a church. There's something waiting for you there. So anyway, Kaylee is here today. Kaylee Henderson. Come on up, Kaylee. She graduated from grade 8 this year. You can stay up for a couple of minutes. We'll get a picture in a moment, Kaylee. Congratulations. Uh, Maria Stencil graduated from grade 8. Pascal Turcott graduated from grade 8. And then in our high school graduates, Isaac Dubay, who is still in Alberta, but Ben says he should be back sometime this week. So hopefully next weekend we'll be able to see him. Uh, Sean Durar graduated uh, this, uh, this year as well. Samantha Marquardt, who is here, graduated from grade 12. Congratulations, Sam. And Samantha is going to Queens in the fall, and so going to join Bethany and keep an eye on her in the fall. Ben Power graduated this year from grade 12. And uh, Ben will be going to the University of Waterloo in the fall this year, and also he was the recipient of Lots of awards and uh, right up at the top of his class. So congratulations, Ben, for working hard. And I know that he does that. <laughs> Sean Turcott graduated from grade 12 as well. And so congratulations to him. And I know that he is going uh, this, uh, this fall. He'll be going to Ottawa to which school? Somebody remind me. Sherry, do you know what school he's going to? Algonquin in Ottawa and in the fall. And then I believe that both Isaac and Sean are going to go into Canadian Forces. And so we'll be working towards that. Pascal and Maria are not going to university yet because they're going to do high school first. So anyway, let's, uh, let's congratulate our graduates that are here today. We're very proud of them. And uh, I'm excited what God is doing in these young people's lives. We're going to get a picture. Here it comes right here. Amen. I get to be in the picture because I graduated in sixth grade here. Amen. Thank you, everybody. All right, a few other announcements I want to talk about here today and uh, 
just a couple of things when it comes to our giving. And there's one thing that I'm going to target today, but a couple of things I want to make you aware of. And just as far as giving towards camp, one of the things that we do at camp every year is that we raise funds towards the mortgage and paying the bills of operating what is an amazing facility. Now, if you've never been to Hikes Bay, you really need to get down there and see. It's 140 acres on Lake Ontario, kilometer and a half of beachfront. It is just, it's a gorgeous piece of property. And it is, uh, it's an amazing thing that we own this. I say we, it's the United Pentecostal Church Ontario District own it. And I think right now our indebtedness that remains is right under $1.7 million. The property is is valued at well over $12 million. And so we have, a, uh, we have an amazing asset there. But we do raise money. And so a lot of the people that were there did give directly towards that from the church. Last I saw, there was 370000 that had been raised towards the camp this year, which is extraordinary. But our church did pledge, in addition to those that were there, we pledged 2000 So if you want to give towards the camp and be a part of that $2,000 pledge, feel free to do that. But also what I would like to more specifically raise money towards is that... I have a sample of carpet tile for our fellowship hall. I do want to say a big thank you to John Kingsbury. The while we were away this week, he painted all of that. It is painted. We're going to refinish all of the the panels that go in there into a more contemporary look. And then I was able, uh, Brother McLaughlin purchased this carpet tile for the platform at the camp, actually. And then they changed their mind at the last moment and went with just a straight black a carpet for there, and uh, they may live to regret that, but uh, moving on. But the good news for us is, is that they have 2,000 square feet of carpet tile, that, and we only need about 1,350 over there right now, but I'm going to probably buy it all, and so we have it maybe for other areas uh, as well. But since they're, they're going to sell it to us for a dollar a square foot, which is you know maybe uh, a quarter of, of what you would actually pay for it, buying it new, if not more. And so anyway, we can get all the carpet we need probably to do the, uh, not only the fellowship hall, but the, the foyer out there, all of that for around $2,000. And so anyway, uh, I will certainly be the first to give. I'll give the first 300 of that towards that. But uh, Brother Haynes is backing me up with 200 there. And uh, all right, Kathy, let's, let's do it then. All right, another 500, so we're at 1,000 there. Anybody else want to give towards that? Okay, Kim, there's 200. Justin, two. Uh, Jim and Judy, so 18, 20. Okay, we're at 22. Okay, you can stop at this point. Uh, just if you want to give as well, you can just back all these people up. Don't worry. We'll spend it on something over there. And so thank you for your generosity and giving towards that. And I just need to get down there and pick up the uh, carpet tile from, um, from a cube van that it's sitting in. And uh, anyway, we'll um, get moving on that. Uh, tonight, we are going to have service here, also Pentecostals of Renfrew. And so, again, those of you that are interested in going to Renfrew, if you can let me know. I'm really excited. There are a number of other ministers uh, and people that have talked about, I, we want to come, and is it okay if we come and visit Renfrew? And I said, well, of, of course. And so, somewhere over the next few months, Pastor McCarty is going to come. Uh, Pastor McCarthy is talking about coming uh, as well, along with other people. Brother Irel wants to come up. Others that are talked about coming. So, it's a exciting that uh, people are interested in what's happening in Renfrew, and I'm really excited for the people in Renfrew to meet other ministers from the district that care about what God is doing in Renfrew as well. Junior camp is uh, basically a week from today. It's going to be starting on the 15th, and so pray for our kids and staff that are going to be there, and uh, and so those are the, the basics here today. Now, I do want to uh, also sing for the birthdays that are happening this week. Now, um, the first of those is Tracy. She's first in the row this week. Joe and Tracy are down with John and Kayla because a baby's about to come, and so we're excited for them to be able to be there. Pascal has a birthday, I believe, on Tuesday. Uh, myself on Wednesday. Colleen, are you Thursday? Thursday or Friday? Friday, and then uh, Hepzibah has a birthday on Saturday, I believe, and so we have got birthdays all week long, and so we all need a song here today, amen.
right, there's probably something that I'm forgetting, but remember it for me. Amen. It is good to see Jordan and Kaylee here this morning. God bless yours. Kaylee, Mateo's. Like, I uh, was wondering about that combo this morning. Well, anyway, we'll sort that out. Great to see you both here today. God bless you. We're going to take up this morning's tithes and offer offerings. It's, let's see, it's not the first Sunday of the month, but if you didn't give missions last week, you can give it to today. So, oh, I want to see him. Our Sunday school crew is away today, and so kids will be staying up. But I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment. Um, but I do want to uh, confirm something. Ian, is, is this your guys' last Sunday before you, you move? Why don't you, what's that? Next, so you'll be here next Sunday? Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I just want to make sure we pray for you before you guys leave. And so, anyway, we are, we're, we are not at all happy to be losing Ian and Janessa. But uh, we do know that that is the, the way of the military. It giveth and it taketh away. And, uh, but we are, we are believing with Sylvie that they're going to give once again here in a few years and, and bring them back. But I'm so thankful what God has been doing in their family. And we love you guys very much. And we will be praying for you. Amen. This morning, I'm going to take you to the word of the Lord now that I got you all seated because I thought I was doing something else. I'm going to have you stand for the reading of God's word. 
And we're going to read from the book of Esther, Esther chapter 4 and verse 11, and then one passage from the book of Hebrews as well. Esther 11, or 4 and 11 says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. By contrast, we have the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 4 and 16. I love this passage. It says this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, an audience with the king. An audience with the king. Let's look to the Lord in the name of Jesus right now. Uh, I pray, oh God, that you would speak into our hearts and our lives. Uh, Father, I thank you, Lord. Uh, God, for the great things that you are doing. God, I'm so thankful uh, for what you're doing in a fury's life, God. And for her baptism, Lord, at the end of this service today, oh God. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for all these you've been filling with your spirit. Uh, God, I thank you, Lord, for the testimony from Steve today, God. Uh, of God, you filling him with your spirit and working in his life. Uh, God, you're doing great things and we give you glory. Uh, and I'm asking God that that work might continue right here, right now. Uh, and that your word, God, would activate something in us. Uh, God, I pray that we as your people would not walk around uh, da downtrodden, Lord. Uh, Lord, with the mindset of beggars and paupers. Uh, when we have been given an invitation into the presence of the king. Uh, help us, O oh Lord, right now, I ask in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. God bless you. you. can be seated here today. I can't remember exactly if it was 2020 or 2021. It was during the season where things were not really fully opened yet, and the world was still kind of different at that point. But my wife and I were trying to do a little bit of, of normalcy and get away as we like to do and just spend some time together. And so we had gone to Ottawa and stayed in a hotel there. And instead of the nice breakfast buffet that we usually could go to, uh, we had to have it brought to our room and eat, eat in our room, you know, which was pathetic because, um, you know, it's hard to go back for seconds and thirds when they've brought it to your room and all you got is what you got. And still pay the pay same price for it. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So afterward, we decided that we would go out and uh, we would walk around the area around the parliament buildings. And so we went and uh, they had, by that point, had already begun some of the construction that's currently going on on the on Parliament Hill there. And so uh, it wasn't always the typical paths. And we were walking, rather than walking straight up towards the buildings where you see the Peace Tower and the typical facade that you would look at, we're having to kind of go around the sides and walking around that area. And, uh, and some random stranger walks up to me and says, uh, he says, you know what? He says, you go be prime minister and I'll help you. He says, we can do a better job than that guy. <laughs> so to recap, we've got some random guy telling another random guy, you should be prime minister and I'll be your deputy. If that is not a winning ticket, I don't know what is. Rando 1 and Rando 2, vote for us. But what he was saying was an expression that's not unusual amongst the governed. And that is that, hey, I think even I could do a better job than the people who are running this country or that country or whatever country. If you look around the world right now, we don't exactly have an A-list of leaders in the world right now. 
Obviously, I believe that we are in the last days and we're, we're kind of uh, very quickly ramping up towards the events of the end and probably the next leader of note in the world is going to be the Antichrist and then the real leader will come after that. But there is a, a general consensus in people around the world. It, it used to be, particularly in the United States where I was born, that when you did polls of the people uh, and you asked them, uh, young people, if they felt like uh, the future looked brighter than the the present. There was always a sense of optimism amongst Americans, a, a feeling like, uh, yeah, our country is great, but it's going to get even better. We look forward to the future. There's anticipation for the future. But over the last, particularly 10, 15 years, that optimism has inverted to where many people feel like the best days of the United States, the best days of Canada, they're in the rearview mirror and they're not in the front windshield. There's a consensus that things are steadily moving in a downward connection. So, politics aside, how many of you would like for a chance to sit down with the prime minister and set things straight? I hear a lot of people feeling like they're ready to run the country. Except for it's not that simple, is it? I could have something incredibly important to share with the prime minister, something that could genuinely help him or benefit the country, but here's the reality. There is no chance of you or me having that kind of access. All access to the halls of power, whether it's here in Canada or in other nations around the world, is carefully guarded. There are very specific protocols for who has access to the prime minister how they have that access, how long they have access, and all of the protocols of how it is going to go down. The United States, over the last uh, uh, presidency here, it has become very standard that even those reporters who have access, uh, there is a standardized list of questions that they are allowed to ask, uh, and uh, they are not to deviate outside of that because everything is very carefully scripted and controlled uh, with very strong protocols that are put in place. And in fact, I believe that a, a big reason why the platform, social media platform, Twitter now X, has become so popular popular is that it's kind of weird in the sense that the high and the mighty are on Twitter or X just like ordinary people are. So the prime minister has a Twitter account and the president has a Twitter account and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, whether it's celebrities, Elon Musk, of course, uh, one of the richest men, if not the richest man in the world who now owns uh, uh, Twitter or X, that he has his own account and people are able to send him messages. And on rare occasions, sometimes even the high and the mighty actually respond to ordinary people. And, and so a part of the popularity of the platform is, is that there's a modicum of access there to where ordinary people have a chance to reach out to someone. And many of you remember a little over a year ago, my uh, YouTube channel had gotten hacked, and so I was locked out of all kinds of things. And, and Ryan says, at that point, I wasn't able to get into any of my Google accounts, all of my things, even though I obviously had plenty of evidence to support, you know, the fact that it's my face and my name all over it is kind of good evidence that it belongs to me. But uh, I, was, I was locked out, and Ryan says, tweet at them. And so I did. And they responded. They would not respond to direct emails through all of the established channels. Nothing. But I tweeted at them, and they responded. Kind of weird. But part of the reason why people like the platform is at least the idea, like, well, yeah, amongst my followers, I've got, you know, I, Bill Gates, you know, I follow him, I follow all these people as if they're actually like friends, you know, and, you know, and I even talk to him sometimes. The problem is he doesn't talk back, but, you know, I talk to him. And so people love the idea of having access, of their voice being heard. Right now, our prime minister has an extremely low approval rating, and by the numbers, he's not very popular. Very likely, he won't be ranked very high on the list of the most successful prime ministers in the history of our country. But you know what? That doesn't change anything when it comes to the access that you and I have to him, whether they're popular 
or unpopular, whether they're successful or unsuccessful, it doesn't change the fact that whether they're good or bad at their job, it doesn't mean you and I can waltz in and say what's on our mind. It doesn't make them any more accessible to me. Now, if you're Jaslyn, throw up the picture there, Nick. It's a different story. Uh, Less than two months ago, Jazz and the PM were hanging out because of a position that she has through her that she serves in, and they had given them an access to have a Q and A and to, to sit down with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and their team. and And so, Jazz, being vocal, she shared some of her thoughts and her ideas with him, and uh, and so she said what was on her mind. But what are the chances that her concerns or thoughts actually meant anything to him? It was actually more of a photo op, a political event designed to court the youth vote. So she had access, something that I've not had, unlikely that you've had. But even having that access doesn't mean that much is going to come of it. In fact, over the last two weeks after some particularly troublesome things that have happened in the political landscape and things that have caused a lot of upheaval and questions within the party and with people around the world about whether he should continue on, uh, what our prime minister has repeatedly said is that, I'm listening. But no one whom I have read seems convinced that that's actually true. They don't think he's listening. This is not a message about politics. It's a message about access. Even knowing all the things that I've just said, you may have picked up on the tenor that maybe not my favorite prime minister either. But I'll say this. If I had an opportunity to meet with the prime minister to have my thoughts and wishes really considered, I'd jump at the opportunity. Because really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much you can say, well, that's not a, that is or is not a person I would vote for. It is always a privilege and honor to be able to step into that kind of opportunity and to speak with someone to share your thoughts. And I would consider it a great honor. Would I not put great thought into what I might say if I was given that opportunity? To take full advantage of that rare once-in-a-lifetime opportunity by seizing those moments. And rather than talking about the weather or something inane, to talk about the things that matter most. Recognizing I've got a really narrow window uh, of opportunity, of access, and I want to say something that's important. uh, Something of significance. And I certainly would be putting thought uh, and prayer into what I might say uh, to make sure that my words were carefully chosen. uh, To where they might have the most benefit and the most access because in that moment it's a window that I'll probably never have again. Our first text passage that we read gives us unique insight into just how restricted the access to King Ahasuerus, or also known as Xerxes, was. Uh, He was, at that point, an emperor, not just a king, uh, reigning over a vast empire with provinces that stretched uh, from India down into Africa and uh, on over even into uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, It spread over a vast zone, uh, and you would go after many, many time zones uh, under the reign all under the reign of King Ahasuerus. And because of his greatness, because of who he was and his significance, we read here in our text that access to him was rigidly controlled. The text passage that we read in Esther 4 and 11, it starts off saying this, All of the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know That any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, there's just one simple law, put all to death. Unless the king shows favor and extends his golden scepter. But that is the exception to the rule. The rule is this. If you walk in unbidden, uninvited, it is immediate death. 
There's no trial. There's no mitigating circumstances. It doesn't matter what you have to say or how important you think you are. But the moment you step in uninvited, there is but one rule, and that is death. And this was so rigidly controlled that his queen, Esther, the one who was favored amongst all the other women, the one whom he had chosen of all the other virgins that had come before him, she who was favored by the king, even she in her mind, she was full of fear over the idea of going into the presence of the king unbidden. And she said, yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. No one comes unless they are summoned. And the law was so rigid and so extreme that the queen herself feared this outcome. And it was a moment of crises. If you're not familiar with the story of Esther, it kind of leads up to this crucial moment that there is a, a man who has risen to prominence in the, uh, the kingdom of Persia. And uh, he, he is a man that has a deep ancestral hatred uh, towards the Jewish people. And that hatred becomes focused on uh, one particular Jew, uh, a minor official in the king's palace uh, by, the, uh, by the name of Mordecai. Uh, and Mordecai, uh, he because he was a Jew and because he bowed to only one that is God that he refused when this man Haman a self-important pompous individual would walk by he refused to bow down as others did and because of that Haman he had a hatred not only to Mordecai but it became the flashpoint for his hatred for the Jews and so he had actually petitioned the king and with a great vast bribe had managed to get a law passed uh, that on a certain day uh, all of the Jews through all of the provinces uh, would be executed and their assets seized uh, and uh, through this it would be a true genocide wiping out the Jewish people across the Persian Empire and of course what the king did not know is that his own queen his favored one Esther she was herself a Jew and they had kept it back because of already the anti-Semitism that was present there. Isn't it ironic how history has a way of repeating itself? Having to conceal her identity because of the underlying current there against her. And so it was the moment when Mordecai had written to her and said, you have been placed here for such a time as this. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to make a difference, to be more than just a, a pretty face who sits on a throne alongside the king, but to actually make a difference. And so he's challenging her and pushing her because he is her uncle, and he actually raised her when her parents were lost. And so she feels the pressure, feels the responsibility of going, but she is so full of fear. Because clearly, if she's not been called for 30 days, she's not maybe in the king's attention in the way that she once was. Maybe doesn't have the favor that she once has, and she fears that if she goes unbidden, that there is going to be a very negative reaction uh, to her presence. Uh, and so uh, she means that, and you know, the fact that she hasn't been called into his presence for, for 30 days means that she is, yes, his wife, but she hasn't even interacted with her husband for 30 days. A month, maybe that he thought that was the key to having a happy marriage, you know, only see her every couple of months and, uh, you know, could be happy to see each other. Absence makes the hearts grow fonder and all that. But the point I want to seize on in this moment is that in this point in time, if the queen herself has that hard of a time getting access to the king, what chance would ordinary people have? Esther, who has been chosen amongst all women, uh, who is in a position of honor and favor, and in theory is the, the king's consort that sits behind, beside him, but even she fears going into his presence unbidden. Well, what chance would anyone, not the queen, have? You see, getting access to the king is no easy thing. It never has been. Now, none of this would have felt strange to the Hebrews of the Old Testament. 
They knew to what it was like to have God's presence, the King of Kings, sealed off from them. That massive thick veil in the tabernacle and then in the temple uh, was a reminder that God's presence uh, was not for the common. Uh, but rather one time a year there was one man, the high priest, uh, that would go through an elaborate ceremony of purification, uh, preparing himself and making himself holy uh, for that time, that venture uh, beyond the veil. Uh, and he would only go not only after purification processes but go after the proper sacrifice had been made and the proper rituals had been observed and then he would deign to slip past the veil into the holy of holies in fact if you read carefully as a part of the high priest design his, his costume there were around his ankles little decorative bells that would jingle as he moved around and often even attached to that, a tether that would go back beyond the veil. And the reason for that is after a long period of time, if they no longer heard the jingle of him moving around, the fear was that God had struck him dead because something had not been done right. And the tether was there, and so it was not safe to go beyond the veil themselves so they could pull him back out. Can you imagine? Not... Only all of you not being able to go to church, but maybe you sitting out in the foyer when I came into church. <laughs> Can I hear him jingling still? <laughs> Sounds like pastor's toast today. <laughs> Somebody pull him out. <laughs> We're going to need a vote here, folks. He was a representative of God's people, and he took the burden and the responsibility of representing all the nation of Israel into the very presence of God. And so when he uh, went in, uh, he was going bearing the burden and the responsibility of access. Uh, but what that means is that there is no one like you or I uh, that would have had direct access into God's presence. Uh, only our representative, uh, much like our government today, uh, our, our member of parliament, uh, she might have access to the prime minister, but she is there representing us. Uh, we don't have that kind of access personally. And so we work through a series of surrogates, and hopefully our voice is reflected through our representatives. And the same was true of the high priest. And so that brings us to one of the most extraordinary things about Jesus' death on the cross. There are many things that are going on in the story of the gospel, and the story that leads up to the day that Jesus hung on the cross. But Matthew points to something that is extraordinary that happened at the moment of Jesus' death. Matthew 27 and 50 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Now, this is an extraordinary thing. Not only, of course, is this veil incredibly thick uh, to such a place that there are no human hands that could have laid hold on that uh, and ripped it, uh, but the Bible says very specifically from top uh, to bottom. Uh, it, that top was up about 30 feet, uh, but it didn't matter. Uh, from the top higher up than this room, uh, all of a sudden it's as if the giant hands of God uh, laid hold on that uh, and ripped that veil wide open. Uh, and because uh, God was sending a message in this moment uh, and Matthew wanted us to be clear uh, what was going on so we too could understand uh, and that was because Jesus died uh, for you and I uh, because of the finished work of Calvary uh, because of Jesus' sacrificial death uh, our sin was no longer a barrier uh, that kept us out of God's presence uh, and God was saying through that symbolic gesture uh, he was saying alright uh, the door is open uh, access is now available to all. It's not just a representative that can come into the before the king of kings. Any of us can come before him. Out of all of the people around the world that are kept at arm's length because they're too important for you or I, at the end of the day, they're just a man. They're just a woman. They may have a title, they may have prestige, 
but all of that is going to fade. If they're a celebrity because of their, they won the genetic lottery, their looks will fade. Despite all of the work of the best plastic surgeons in L.A. If it is a dignitary, a prime minister, or president, their term will come to an end. And they will slip off into obscurity. But it's not just a man or a woman who has invited us in. We're talking about the eternal king. The God of the universe. The all-powerful, ever-living one has invited us directly into his presence. We read in Hebrews 4 and 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we can have an audience with the king any time. But I want you to look a little bit further than that, because Scripture says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. This isn't access for perfect people uh, who have it all figured out. Uh, This isn't just for the ultra holy, uh, but rather we seek grace uh, because it is the undeserved, the unmerited favor. Uh, We're not coming before him because we deserve to be there, uh, but rather uh, he says uh, you can come to the throne of grace. Uh, You don't have to come in timidly. Uh, You can come boldly uh, into the throne of grace. Uh, And neither is this access just for those who have it all together. But it says that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, things are going bad. When you don't have things figured out. When you're messing up. When you have a need of grace. It says you can come directly and find grace and help in time of need. You see, God is saying not only can you come into my presence... But he's inviting us to bring our problems and our needs to him. You know, one of the biggest problems with politicians, particularly career politicians, is that they become very insulated from the reality of the real life that people lead. They're insulated from all that. They can't, they they often will make mistakes when they try to talk about the high prices at grocery stores or at the gas pump because it's been years since they've gone grocery shopping. It's been years since they've had to fill up a car at the pump themselves. But that's not true of our God. Look at what the two verses before our text say. Hebrews 4 and 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. God not only gives us access, He not only will actually listen, but He also sympathizes with our weaknesses and our needs. He's not distant and out of touch with the realities that we face. He faced them too. He understands. So let me sum this up here today by bringing it home to you. You See, Satan does not want you to take advantage of your access to the king. You'll find that from the moment that that veil was torn down and the day of Pentecost, the church was birthed and the promise was as the promise is to you and your children and all that are far off. It is clear uh, that God was opening the door wide to everyone. Uh, But you'll find that very quickly uh, when men begin to get in control of religion uh, they begin to shut down access. Because if everybody has access then nobody's special. We can't have an elite class and that is something that the elites will never like. And so we see that there is all of the roadblocks put in people's place. And Satan is behind that. He wants to keep you far away uh, from the one you can, who can help you. Uh, because God has given you free access uh, and said you can come boldly. Uh, you can stop by whenever you want. Um, Satan is continually trying to come up with roadblocks uh, to keep you from getting to God. Gets in your head and tells you God doesn't care about you. You're not important. You're not special. You're not holy. You're not one 
of the chosen, the elect, the elite ones. It tells you that God can't or won't forgive you because you're somehow a worse sinner than others. They'll try to make you so ashamed when you fail and when you come short that you hide away from God. God says, come boldly in your time of need. Satan says, you can't go there. Look at what you've done. Shame fills you. They'll try to make you so afraid of what God might do to you to make you never want to leave your seat and move to him. Here's one that he really loves to do and a lot of people fall for. He'll deceive you into thinking you need to fix yourself and then come to God. You know why Satan loves that one? Because it'll never happen. You can't fix yourself. You can't make things right and then come to God. But I've heard it hundreds of times over my time as a pastor. People who are saying, yeah, I, I am hungry. I do want to come to God, but I've got to work some things out first. And Satan is there rubbing his hands in glee because he's got them right where he wants them. Here's someone hungry that could give their life to God, that could come boldly to the throne of grace and get exactly what they need. Uh, But they won't get there uh, because they're thinking they need to clean themselves up uh, and then come to God when they've got everything all together. Not knowing when they look around a room like this uh, is that this is not a group of people uh, that got themselves together. uh, But rather we were people who were broken and dirty. uh, And it's God that cleaned us up. uh, And God that did the work of restoration in our lives. Uh, But if Satan can deceive you into thinking, uh, you've got to make that happen for yourself. You'll never get to God. God has given you access. The king has given you access. But it's wasted if you don't take advantage of it. I'm going to invite the music to come back at this point. And before we respond here today, I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment. And we're going to try to paint a mental picture for you today. I want you to think about this. I want you to imagine that you today have received a personal invitation from the King of Kings. It came in a beautiful envelope over the fold where... The envelope is closed. There's a gold seal that's embossed, beautiful with the symbol of the king. And on the opposite side, in the most flowing and beautiful calligraphy, is your name, handwritten, inviting you in. As you lift up that seal and you look inside, there is a thick, rich card inside that formally invites you by name to come at your convenience into the very throne room of God. And God says, you're invited to come whenever you want. And we'll talk about whatever you want. You don't need to hold back. You can tell me about your deepest, darkest secret. You can tell me about your most painful moment and your greatest need. And his promise to you is, whatever it is, whatever you want to talk about, Whatever you want to deal with, I'll help you with it. I will put my resources at your disposal to help it solved. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity, but it's come in your name today from the king saying, I want to spend time with you. And the reason why I want you to get that mental picture in your head is that is exactly what God is doing. He's reaching to you right now. And he's saying, I want you to come. He's calling you by name, saying, you matter to me. I care about you. I care about your need. I care about your burden. Come to me. And now I want to invite you to stand with me. And I'm going to invite you to act upon that invitation that you've received from God today to come boldly to the throne of grace. I can't guarantee you access to the prime minister today, but someone far greater than he has said, come on in. Come to me today and I will meet with you and talk with you and I'll provide for your need because I care for you. Thank you, Jesus.